Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time. It is Wednesday. We have our longest running guest and the one that you all love, Anna Kelly. How are you doing, Anna? I'm always doing so much better after we talk. <laughs> the highlight of my day. Isn't it great to be able to give back and have fun and love what you're doing? Absolutely. Give back, have fun. You get to interact with really smart people. It's, it's an awesome part of my day. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, what I want to talk about here is... Um, I am in the camp that I think the Fed is painted themselves into a corner and they can't, they're, they're just trapped. I don't know what else to say. And, and, and because I believe that, I think it's, it's time for folks to step back and realize that, you know what, we already have negative rates, right? The 10 year may be talking about 1.3, but if you have a 1.3 10 year and you got 5.4% CPI, which came out today, you're at, what is that? What is that? 1.3. That's negative 4%. We already have negative rates. And um, because of that, what I want to do is I want to get assets that go up with inflation and I want to have assets that produce cash flow. The Fed is stuck. Absolutely. Yes. And interest rates is one of the only tools in the tool belt that the Feds really have to try to control the um, path of the economy and whether we have, you know, inflation or deflation or stagflation. It's really the interest rates that control it. And once rates get really low, they don't have a lot elsewhere to go other than raising them. But we could talk about, you know, zero rates um, that would make us even more negative when you look at the, the fact that CPI is up so high. Yeah, CPI came out today, 5.4%. Second, second month in a row, June was the same number. You're going to hear all the talking heads talk about CPI. The core inflation, Anna, was less than expected. That is such a joke. Core inflation doesn't include food or gas. So let me ask, does anybody watching this can exist without food or gas? I mean, it's it's mind boggling how uh, the government tries to report numbers to confuse people. Yes. In fact, I drove by the gas station. I'm very blessed that my husband fills up my car with gas a lot because he knows that I'll run out because I don't pay <laughs> enough attention. Even after 40 years, I drove by the gas station. It was like 364 yesterday. It is for four, it's 499 in California. No way. So, you know, yes, the, and, and that's to the point of on our first video when we talk about inflation, CPI has been manipulated and changed many times over the 50 years to make it look like inflation is lower than what it actually is. And they've taken out so many of these things from the basket of goods that we really need and rely on every day mm -hmm. that make our cost of living go up substantially. Yeah. So I, I think there's an interesting dichotomy going on right now. I think we're on the cusp, at least of the next year to 18 months of significant wage inflation. As we talked about in episode one, wage inflation, or maybe it was episode number two, can drive values of other things, especially levered things like single family homes. And um, it's, it's going to feel good and not feel good because again, most people are going to look at their salaries and go, or their, or their hourly wage and go, hey, I'm making... 10% more money. I'm just making up a number. But the 10% more money in an environment where inflation is 12%, you're actually losing. And not a lot of people look at that. Right, right. And not a lot of people look at leverage and say, what is my net leverage, right? What's the net return? So when you talk about negative interest rates, you're talking about the fact that although the interest rate is high, the, the cost of living and in inflation is higher. And so there's a spread on that which makes investing extremely attractive because you're, you're transferring that inflation risk to the bank when the, you have a leveraged debt rather than using your own cash. Yeah. Yeah, folks, again, as we've talked about this, th today's episodes with Anna, one, two, and three is about understanding what's in front of us. Inflation's in front of us, taxes in front of us, uh, real estate, rent, the, all the things that we're dealing with are in front of us, but you can still get a gift of a reduced 30-year rate mortgage. 30-year mortgages should not be this cheap today, is my opinion. Absolutely. If I could, I'd go buy a whole, 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 whole lot of single family houses and lock in that 30-year, you know, sweet, low fixed debt for a very long time. Yeah. The other thing I want to just realize, uh, because again, you've, you've been investing a long time, just like me, is uh, would you agree with the following statement? What I've seen historically is values run first, meaning values or prices of housing, and shortly thereafter, rent follows as well. There's like a lead lag. Uh, would you agree with that? Absolutely, because as it becomes more, more expensive in terms of 
the idea of housing prices equating with expensive. As housing prices go, as housing prices go up um, and that mortgage payment ticks up, people that can't afford the down payment or they can't buy still want to live in that nice house. And so they're going to be paying a premium for that rent to be able to get a nice house, almost as nice as what they could, could live in. And because owners who are buying right now that are paying high prices are gonna charge more for the rents than the landlords that held onto them for a very long time. But yes, I've always seen the rents go up as soon as housing prices go up. Yeah, and then just total, total left field comment, maybe should have talked about this in episode number two. One of the things I'm seeing as the numbers uh, uh, go up is people become down payment constrained. But let's not forget, they're talking about a $15,000 gift or whatever credit or whatever you want to call it for, for buyers to use at down payment. And again, that will, that will um, let's just say if that happens, prices are going to shoot higher. Yes. And that's what's so hard to really predict. You know, people ask me all the time, and I'm sure they ask you all the time, where are housing prices going? <laughs> when is the crash going to happen and how badly? And should I stop investing until it happens so that I can just sit on the sidelines and scoop them up when they're cheap. We don't know if and when housing prices are gonna come down. There's things that we can look at like regionally, how much supply is there versus how much demand is coming there and how long is it gonna to take to build new housing to keep up with the demand. So we can look at those kind of things, but just like we were talking about when we looked at your spreadsheet and the affordability, the, um, I think it's the American Redevelopment Act. I forget what George Bush called it, but I was in private banking at Bank of America the year that this big housing affordability push was there. And we were told you are incentivized and paid to do mortgages for people that can't afford them as long as they attend this you know, financial, here's how you budget um, class, then they could get the big credit for their house. Wow. And what we saw from that is that housing demand increased because there was artificial money to, to supply the money for them to make those down payments so housing demand goes up, and when that happens, whether it's artificially or government-induced or not, prices are going to go up simply because there's more demand, and therefore housing prices have to go up. But as soon as that demand stops or people can't pay or those programs go away, then demand comes down and then housing prices follow. So it, it really is all about supply and demand. Mm -hmm. But right now, those that are in office um, on the Democratic side, especially housing affordability is a big thing for them. So it's why you still continue to have, you know, eviction moratoriums and these talks of infrastructure projects and gifting money and 40 year mortgages, I'm sure are coming to help oh, people yeah. that had a forbearance. Right. So as long as the government props up these kind of programs to induce people to buy a house, housing prices aren't coming down. They're going to continue to go up. The question is, in what price range and in what locations is that going to happen? And that's where, to your point about data, you've got to get really, really good at being a subject market expert mm -hmm. in your given markets yeah. and knowing how these things are going to impact you and what you should buy. Yeah, folks, hopefully what you're taking away from all three of these episodes is it's time to focus and do the work. Uh, if you don't, it's going to get uncomfortable, as we talked about in episode number one. So, Anna, do me a favor. Tell us about Greater Purpose Capital and... Uh, that's just a great thing you're doing. Thank you so much. So Greater Purpose Capital is my apartment syndication company where we go out and we buy large apartment complexes. We bring in investors who want to invest passively in an alternative to the stock market, alternative to buying your own properties. And we help you to have the tax, the, the income and the appreciation benefits, investing in apartment complexes, but really investing with purpose and really make coming in to make a meaningful impact on the lives of our residents while we're creating good returns for ourselves. So if you're interested in passive investing, you can follow me at greaterpurposecapital.com, join my investor tribe, or on Facebook at Anna REI Mom Kelly. Do yourself a favor, follow her on Facebook. It's always a great reach. She's talking about deals and events and, and really a balanced life, which I truly appreciate. So Anna, have a great week. Thank you very much. Thanks. You too, Michael. Mm -hmm.